you take the local food movement to its logical extreme, then you've got to say that people who live beyond their local food shed are essentially parasites. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we're talking with Pierre de Rocher, who's the co-author with Hiroko Shimizu of The Locavore's Dilemma in Praise of the 10,000-Mile Diet. Pierre, thanks for uh, letting me mangle your last name. <laughs> All we hear about now is you got to go direct from farm to table to whatever. Uh, what's good about a 10,000-mile diet as opposed to locally grown food? Well, many things. I mean, the first questions we ask in the book is a very simple one. I mean, if everything was so great when food, uh, when most food was sourced locally two centuries ago, why did we go through the trouble of developing a globalized food supply chain in the first place? And as we point out in the book, well, you know, we now have more food, it's more diverse, it's more affordable, uh, we're taller, we live longer lives, we're healthier, we're more food secure. So really, there are only good things to say about the 10,000 mile. But diet. isn't the, uh, I mean, don't people say, hey, you know what, the fact that we can eat food from anywhere, that's why we're so damn fat. Well, what I would respond to that is that uh, my wife, who's Iroko, happens to be Japanese. And they depend more on the global food supply chain than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And go to Japan, and they're not fatter than we are. Mm -hmm. I mean, ultimately, uh, the cupcake uh, doesn't jump into your mouth. It's up to you. Mm -hmm. The globalized food supply chain offers us more opportunities. Right. But ultimately, it's a matter of personal responsibility. I mean, people have access to more healthy food than ever before. And, but they also have access to more junk food. Where, where does the pushback come from in terms of, uh, you know, saying, I mean, and, and, you know, of people saying, OK, well, you shouldn't eat factory farm chicken or factory raised uh, vegetables you should eat organic then when organic because you know Walmart and yeah, exactly, United States sells the a lot and then it's like no it's got to be locally grown organic well that's right? the problem I mean uh, Walmart uh, gives you fair trade coffee Walmart gives you organic food so what's an activist gonna do I mean what is the last well, refuge? so what are they what are what are they after because they're not about saying okay it's got you you got to eat organic it's no, you got to eat organic and plus and yes. this and that so what are what are what are they I'm driving not sure towards? I mean to be honest there's a lot of reaction against globalization I mean reverting back to your tribe or your local food shed is, a one, is one way to stick it to globalization. Uh, at the same time, uh, there's a lot of romanticism uh, going on about this. I mean, I was raised in the countryside. For me, producing food is a job. Right. But for a lot of suburban and urban kids, well, you know, you put the seed in the ground, some manure, it grows, oh wow, you know, the miracle of life. So I suspect there's a lot of naivety in that respect and also a profound misunderstanding of the problems inherent to a local food supply uh, limitation. And what I mean by that is that historically, uh, people would starve and be malnourished because they did not have access to the surplus of regions that had good years. So typically two bad harvests in a row and you would have a famine. Mm -hmm. Famine only disappeared really with the railroads and the steamships that allowed to move huge quantities of food from regions that had good years to regions that had bad years. Uh, what is the, uh, what's the role of kind of localism, you know, or protectionism really? And it, I mean, it would be termed in a, in a different debate. Um, uh, how is that? How is that driving food bans and whatnot? I mean, in places like oh, New York is. City, you've got the size of cups, you know, you, you know, soda cups and things like that. Foie gras has but production and sales have been banned in California. What what's going on with that, and how does it fit into oh. the themes of your book? Well, the theme of the book, I mean, it's well, it's really, I mean, I'm at reason, so I can say the theme of yeah. the book is really freedom. Right. <laughs> it's really freedom to choose and freedom to buy where you want to buy from, freedom to source the food where you want to source it from. Uh, I don't know, I guess a lot of politicians need to keep busy, a lot of activists now focus on food because people feel disconnected with it. Somehow they don't care where their iPad is coming from, uh, they don't care where the software that allows them to connect uh, local farmers and local consumers through so-called community-supported agriculture comes from. But the fact that we, food, that we put food into our bodies has always had an emotional reaction to it. And at the same time, it was led by people in places like Berkeley, which have an almost year-round supply of local food. So, of course, you can try to stick it to the man in Berkeley doing yeah. it that way, but exporting it to Buffalo or Toronto, where I'm from, or Quebec, just doesn't make any sense. How did you get interested in this? I mean, you tell a great story at the very beginning of the book about how well, the great chef Jacques Pepin left literary studies because he wasn't allowed to write about food in the uh, yeah, early exactly. 60s. No, well, now, I mean, like, lucky yeah. for America, yeah. Jacques, Jacques Pepin, PhD yeah. in literature proposal was turned down because right. food was too pedestrian, I right. guess. But of course, if you take the local food movement to its logical extreme, then you've got to say that people who live beyond their local food shed are essentially parasites. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got dragged uh, sort of kicking and screaming into this whole debate, because Ziroko, my co-author and wife, and I attended a talk a few years ago uh, 
from, given from, uh, by a prominent uh, Canadian environmental studies professor who argued that the Japanese were the most parasitical people on Earth mm. because they import more food than anybody else on a per capita basis. And Iroko, of course, being treated as an economist, was like, well, we don't have land to grow the food. We specialize in something else. We don't ask for charity. We pay for our food. Why are we labeled parasites? And so the book, again, is an attempt to bring in some basic economic logic and argument about freedoms and to essentially sing the praise of the globalized food supply chain. Well, it certainly does that. Pierre de Rocher, uh, the co-author with Hiroko Shimizu of The Locavore's Dilemma in Praise of the 10,000-Mile Diet. Thanks so much for talking Thanks to us. Thanks for having me. For Reason TV, I'm Nick Gillespie.